Welcome. This is Harriet Goodman Grayson. Let me use my whole <laughs> full name today because I'm with theatrical people and this is theater. Uh, welcome to Community Culture Showcase. We're going to have a, a, a wonderful opportunity to meet a really talented woman in the community. She is a teacher. She is a playwright. She is an actress. She has been to New York and she's back here in our local community. Uh, we are really lucky in this mystic, westerly, Stonington area to have a lot of wonderful artists and I have been very privileged that I've had the opportunity to have a few of them on my program. So I hope you'll enjoy this because her performances have been wonderful and they are of social importance and I don't want to get into politics but crazy stuff is happening so let me introduce Emma Pazare. I'm going to screw up your name. <laughs> Palzire, you got to make a nice short name, then it'll be it'll be easier. Emma, welcome. Thank we you. have known each other for many years, yep. uh, through all kinds of iterations of our own lives. Mm -hmm. So, I'm glad to have you on my show again. Glad to be here. Yep. So, tell us what has you been doing during the well, midst of all this COVID nonsense? Yeah. yeah. So, COVID pretty much shut theater down. Um, I was. Uh, doing a play in 2020, uh, The Woodhull Project, um, about Victoria Woodhull, who ran for president in 1872, and uh, 2020 being the centennial of the passing of the 19th Amendment. You better tell uh, people what that is, because they're not yeah, going to know. Yeah, that's um, when women, white women, got the right to vote. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, my goal was to have bookings every month to help celebrate. Uh, that centennial and I had one at the beginning of March and that uh, you know uh, and the whole world didn't know that that was going to be the last live in-person uh, performance for a good while so um, you, you know it's kind of was staying apprised of what was happening with theaters how many theater artists were trying to figure out how to go online and how to uh, still do their work a lot of playwrights were feeling, well, I, you know, playwrights finally said, whoa, I have all this time. I finally have it, what I've always dreamed of, time to sit at home alone and write. <laughs> <laughs> and then people were like, I don't feel creative. I can't make up anything more dramatic than what's happening in the world. I'm at a loss, right? I don't feel like writing comedy right now. Um, and then there started to be some funds becoming available um, through COVID relief efforts. And Connecticut Office of the Arts um, created a program called Artists Respond. Um, and I applied for a grant to uh, redirect the Woodhull Project for a virtual production mm -hmm. um, to give people that opportunity of celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment since all those celebrations pretty much had gotten canceled right. and so I was funded to do that and really started this whole process of how do you move theater to a virtual space keep it theatrical um, you you lose that in-person connection but you mm -hmm. can still find a way to connect uh, with people I think and um, it's not as simple as just videotaping what you're doing in person, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I think most theater people know a videotape of a live, you know, setting a camera in the back of the room to capture, uh, to record a live performance just doesn't cut it. So moving even more to this very intimate um, space, you know, you really have to think of the production from a different perspective and find ways to engage the audience you can't just talk at the camera for right you know right how right. do you um engage the audience through that I medium mean, so in some cases yeah. people are literally watching you on a cell phone right that <laughs> that that is your that is your screen yeah. forget yeah. about even a laptop you know there mm -hmm. are lots of people um who don't own laptops yeah. and they they experience things yeah. virtually through that little cell yeah. phone and yet right or laptop size mm -hmm. or plugging your laptop into a flat screen tv but i've 
you know, I recently saw a movie on the big screen that I had watched on TV streaming. And boy, were there things I saw that I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even on a TV, let alone on a screen smaller than that. So it's your experience, right? So it's like the viewer's experience is different in all of those. And certainly a lot of people said, nope, not doing virtual theater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the same. I don't want to watch it. I don't want to produce it. I don't want to be any part of it, right? <laughs> and uh, I just felt I had to keep creating and doing something. Um, and that solar performance specifically lends itself to virtual performance. You don't have some of the technical issues you have if you've got lots of characters. Where right. are you gonna, right. How are you going to pack all those into a little right. um, phone screen? Um, and it was kind of, a lot of theater artists described it as the Wild West. Like there was this leveling of the field where suddenly everybody was free to be creative and figure out how to do it and uh, develop their own voice and, and method of how they were going to do virtual theater. And there were a lot of forums where theater artists were kind of sharing, like, oh, here's how we made this effect. or. Here's how we, um, you know, here's what you do so you can hear the voice and not have to see the person. Or here's, you know, here's this other platform you can use. Or, so it was also where everybody started sharing what, as they were learning um, and doing, bringing theater online, um, how to navigate all the technical things and, uh, you know, with all technology, right? You sometimes have to think of some back way in, right? <laughs> Outsmart the machines and, and figure out how to do it. And then, of course, um, you're not just the performer <laughs> when you're doing virtual theater. You're the lighting designer. You're the set designer. You're right. the costumer. So right. then also figuring out how to do all these, add all these elements um, and literally think outside the box, right? <laughs> out of the, sure. um, to... Uh, make something that's um, artful and engaging. And you think there's some lessons to be learned from this COVID experience in terms of how we have now literally can perform on a cell phone um, screen or on a laptop or uh, for those more sophisticated, it's the, it's the TV screen, but have we less, there's just some lessons there that well, we can bring forward, maybe good things might happen out of it? Absolutely, because I, I mean, I think um, it's much more about, uh, right, I mean, I think we're in an age where everybody can be a storyteller mm -hmm. and everybody can share, but then there's that uh, defining what you and your message is and finding an audience, right? There's still a lot that's out there that nobody ever sees, and then there's things that boom, take off, right, <laughs> and go viral. So, um, you know, really I think it's like, <laughs> you know, if you're going to go to the trouble of doing it, have a plan of how you're going to find the people that you want to see it. You know, who's going to, um, doing it is great, and that practice is great, but if you really want to connect with people, you still have to figure out, you know, I said you're all those other things, a lighting designer, set designer, you're also, right, marketing it. So, right, exactly. Right? The How message. are you going to use the channels, especially when people can't gather in person um, or aren't going out? You know, how are you going to find the people to see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, f I found some things, for example, where people didn't want to go for meetings and stuff. Mm -hmm. They prefer this kind of Zoom mm -hmm. idea. And then mm -hmm. there's a few things that I've actually heard from people where they actually see more people because uh, you can see uh, people can, unlike a, in, right. a, in person, people can come from Washington State, they can come from Tokyo, they can come yeah. from anywhere around the world and be part of, yeah. the, a and, part of the audience. And I have had great experiences. I uh, used to be part of this um, group for producers in New York called Theater Resources Unlimited. And I happened to hear, I was talking with somebody who said they were speaking at a thing and it was virtual. And I went and they started doing a Friday, a workshop every Friday afternoon, just on a different topic. So they were doing a lot about, do we keep doing theater? Do we do it virtually? How do we do it? They were a lot of people who were sharing 
here's how we mm -hmm. produce this play, right. or we did ours differently, we did it this way. And so I reconnected with this whole theater community that I had been a part of 20 years ago. Like, you know, I went to the first one, I was like, wow, there's actually people on here I know, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. haven't seen them in 18 years or something. Um, so that's been fantastic. I also met new theater artists that I've connected with mm -hmm. by attending those things. I've um, done virtual shows with friends in New Jersey. Uh, a college friend who lives in California, who I literally haven't seen since college, out of the blue, they, you know, we see each other on social media, said, hey, would you like to play this part in this uh, reading of a play I wrote? Um, it's called Curse of the Lake House, <laughs> and you can find it on curseofthelakehouse.com. Uh, really cool story. Um, you know, so I did that reading. He, he and he did a whole different process of he recorded each scene. Each scene is separate characters. It's kind of like a, a story about this uh, lake house, right. this land, this history of the land that this lake house is on, and this curse. Um, and mine is kind of set in the 1600s oh, in okay. the witch trials. So oh, that's the, all right, all right. <laughs> the yes, origin yes. story of the curse. So, right, um, right. Uh, but he just kind of recorded very informally our reading the scene and did a whole bunch of post-production with Editing other visuals yeah. and music. Yeah. And um, so now there's uh, Curse of the Lake House can be viewed on the website and uh, there's now a podcast version and now there's interviews connected with the podcast. So, See, there you so go. It brought yes. into this big project right. reconnected with uh, somebody I hadn't seen since college and like that would have been possible. Nobody would have thought that way um, two and a half years ago. So right. I've really been connected to some fun projects. Did another um, production with a company in New Jersey called First Flight Theater that does kind of historical uh, dramas. So, you know, like American history kind of uh, and unknown that, and that's historical been your, plays. There's, that's been your kind of genre. You're, you know, not from the Laugh Out Loud comedy people, but you've been, at least the stuff that I've seen, had been very historic and uh, socially pointed, but not in a beat you over the head kind of way, but yeah. much slower and, and so you can absorb it. Yeah, I, um, in my solo work, I like to tell the stories of women that we haven't been taught about or at least not given a perspective on. Um, just because I'm fascinated, well, I'm angry about it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm angry that we weren't taught about women who okay. have done really amazing uh, things in their lifetimes, but, um, uh, they, but then there's also that layer of commentary about what does that mean today that we mm -hmm. never learned about these women or, oh, we were taught about them in this very narrow, limited, um, you know, good girl kind of way, right? So, right. Uh, so I love to tell those stories. And um, so how with the Woodhull Project, how mm -hmm. did that get going in your head? I mean, what did, is it, did it change from the moment you thought, oh, I should do something like this to... <laughs> well, uh, it took a long time because... Um, I learned about Victoria Woodhull when I was researching Harriet Beecher Stowe, and there's a pretty in-depth uh, connection between Woodhull and the Beecher family, because she is the reason that Henry Ward Beecher went to trial for adultery. Mm. Long story. Right. <laughs> uh, so I kind of like heard about her and thought, oh, that's really fascinating. I never heard of that woman before. And then a couple of biographies came out about her around that time, mm -hmm. um, and especially in the Hartford Papers, because the research was done at the Stowe Center. You know, my mother would save me these articles from the newspaper. Um, uh, and then I just was kind of thought, oh, I'll go back to that someday. And then I think it was the 2008 presidential election. I thought, mm. oh, there really should be a play about mm -hmm. this woman who ran for president in 1872. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll do that. And every four years, I kind of thought, well, I really should do that this year, right? <laughs> um, but it was 2016 where it really was, I'm doing this this year. Um, you know, and I had already been writing it 
like the couple years prior to that. Um, but as you know, because you participated in the, um, uh, we had a playwright retreat that I really kind of was focusing a couple years on that project. In 2016, I signed up for the Providence Fringe Festival so that I would definitely like, you know, have that deadline. Mm -hmm. And it, just by happenstance um, that the Providence Fringe Festival coincided with the Democratic Convention when Hillary Clinton was nominated. Okay. So it was fascinating. I had three performances over the course of that week. And it was fascinating that every audience heard the play very differently because we were living through this process of the first woman in a long time being nominated to run for president. Right. So, right. you know, not politically, but just like as a matter of history, mm -hmm, right? Like mm -hmm. people heard different elements of the story as we moved through that week, which was fascinating, you know, because I'm always in tune and listening to the audience to kind of feel those nuances like changing as, um, as the week progressed. So, and it is a one woman show. It is. Yep. So you have this intimacy with the audience because you are mm -hmm. the total focus mm -hmm. of their attention, mm -hmm. which puts it in a very different parameter than say uh, 10 piece people or something, something like that, where it's yeah. much more, you are the center of the right. Everything. Yeah. I Although, mean, you know, uh, creatively, when you're writing a one person show, you really have to think about why is this person telling their story now and who are they telling it to? Um, and with Woodhull, I went in a totally different direction than I ever mm -hmm. had before. And I thought, she's here today. Right. She was a clairvoyant and a spiritualist. So I thought, like, you know, her time traveling wouldn't that be, <laughs> like, such a leap. And uh, I started to think about what would her commentary be on, uh, you know, this is, and this is back in 2016, and then, you know, 2018, 20, right? Like, all along. Um, because when I read her speeches and lectures and essays, they rang true today. She wrote mm -hmm. a lot about women's issues and thereby children's issues, mm -hmm. you know, about the welfare of women and children um, and women's rights. And boy, like, we are still solving mm -hmm. a lot of it. So, um, you know, I thought that would be interesting if she were here speaking to an audience today. Um, uh, you know, would she feel that she had made any difference in the world if these, <laughs> right? know, if these issues are still being um, debated and um, uh, we just still don't have solutions to them? To, you know. Did you find as the uh, performer that your actual performance changed? from 2016 till on? I mean, did you, did you make any changes in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the play uh, itself? Well, we now have a female vice president, so yes. I'll yes. <laughs> change a line about that. Um, surprisingly, not too much. I, okay. A few little um, Just references, little, okay. and right. um, it's kind of a little bit fluid in terms of the circumstances, right? Like, I do change if it is today that she's speaking, right? Like. When I was doing the play in 2016, people would say, well, you're going to have to rewrite that next year, <laughs> right? Like, so I was like, okay, well, you know, like it's a little bit fluid where I can change um, the purpose of addressing the audience. So in a clip that we're going to see today, mm -hmm. when I was doing it during COVID, you know, it was to celebrate the centennial, that the audience was there to mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment and... Um, you know, that's why she was come back to speak to people. <laughs> so. Do we have that clip? Shall we show it? This is a video clip. This was done in... Is everyone in the right place at the right time? <laughs> you look confused. Isn't this the centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment? I'm Victoria Woodhull, your special guest. I am so glad we could meet. There is a lot of work to do. Let's begin with 
today's date. Oh, would one of you please go into the chat box? It's the, um, it says chat there on the bottom of your screen and type out for me today's full date. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Wonderful, it worked. <laughs> and uh, who can tell me what this is? Hmm? It's the year I first ran for president. Now, subtract that from today and 148 years have passed and the United States still has not had a woman president. You don't know who I am, do you? Well, I ran for president three times, if you want to get technical. I was the first woman to open a stock brokerage on Wall Street. I was the first woman to publish her own newspaper. The first woman to address Congress. Yet, you haven't been taught about me. You won't read about me in your history books, and you won't see me in your documentaries about women's suffrage. <laughs> Part it's of my own cause. You know, people think that if you stop telling your story, it's because you are ashamed. That is not always true. Sometimes you stop telling your story because it's time has not yet come. I have been patient. I have come to some of you in visions. I have spoken through your thoughts. You're attending a centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment virtually, for God's sakes. The time is now. If we don't act, I fear the worst. Is it my fault? Yeah, I never penned the opus that would have set me right before the world and the coming generations. Have I left any legacy at all? That is what haunts me. So as a performer and as mm -hmm. a playwright, what did you think you learned from trying, you know, taking on this, this particular role? Um, well, I, I had a lot of fun with anachronism, like taking somebody from the 1800s and putting them today. And um, I just, it's the first time I've done that okay. with a solo piece, which was really, um, I have fun with that because it's fun to also see the audience catch on. Like, oh, wait a minute, she's here today, but she's like, right, you know? Um, and I would say the other, outstanding element is that I have found people often say, when I say, oh, here's what the play is about, they go, oh, I'm really sorry I never heard of her. And I say, don't be sorry, be angry, <laughs> right? <laughs> I say, don't be sorry. Most people don't know about her. The first woman to ever give an address to Congress, and she spoke, she made a case for why, this was 1870, she made a case for why women constitutionally already had the right to vote. This was a woman who did not have formal education, who pulled herself up from her bootstraps <laughs> and got herself out of rural Ohio in an abusive marriage to New York City and supported herself quite well and um, educated herself and uh, could articulate these arguments about women's and children's rights um, so amazingly. So, um, and yet we haven't been taught, you know, it's, um, you know, we see a lot of this today. She was literally painted as a demon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a famous Condé Nast cartoon where she, they put devil horns on her right. because of everything she represented. So, um, you know, it's not surprising in that regard that we weren't taught about her, but, um, you know, she, 
she wasn't somebody safe to, <laughs> to, to teach about in, in some ways. Um, you know, she wasn't the Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton that came from genteel backgrounds and were educated. And, um, um, uh, but you but know, actually it really is an insight. Was yeah. actually more important for people who didn't come from good families with lots of yeah. money and opportunity. Yeah. It was, in fact, the people that were on the bottom of the economic ladder yeah. that actually had the most to gain yeah. from things like the ability to vote. Because you could vote, then you might be able to change and kick out some of the people yeah. that were mm -hmm. responsible for keeping you down in the bottom, yeah. which is what made yeah. you revolutionary and someone to be afraid of. And in this day and age, if she had written a bunch of books, they might be on somebody's ban the books, mm -hmm. burn the books, you know, in some of these crazy yeah. states yeah. where they're butting into school districts and coming up with nonsensical stuff. Uh, but yeah, and so that really that, um, just how much of history have we not been taught in school? And, you know, the show is nonpartisan and the message is, vote and fight for your rights right. um, at the end of it. I really wanted to explore the whole issue of how come we don't know about her? How come she didn't tell her? Because, you know, for all her wild things that she did and accomplished in her life, toward the end of her life, she chose to move to Great Britain. She married a uh, a lord of some kind, you know, she married into a very wealthy British family, as did her sister, who was kind of her sidekick all along. And, um, uh, you know, she still was speaking on things, but it's kind of a, you know, 360, right? Like, well, it's tired, exhausting. exhausted. It's exhausting to try right, to right. Beat, uh, beat the drum and yeah. you don't have people that are listening to yeah. you. Yeah, so like, you know, leave the country, you just like, go have an easier life. Um, you know, so that kind of fascinated me too. She mm. never told her own story. Um, and why, why don't, you know, it's a little bit clearer why our history books didn't tell her story or, you know, right. And she's been buried, but how come she didn't tell her story and right. why did she like choose to at the end of her life, which I turned into, well, it's not resolved. I got to come back. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And just my own creative way of telling that story. So you went from that woman, one woman performance to another woman who was probably much better known, at least. Um, somebody has some knowledge of, mm -hmm. of her. Why don't you talk to us about how, was sure. there Woodhall then, you moved on to this, or actually, were they actually, um, no, I, actually fermenting in your brain uh, at the same time? I wrote the play about Harriet Beecher Stowe about 20 years ago for a Civil War um, themed event um, where I thought I wanted to propose a character, but I didn't want to be the wife of somebody mm -hmm. or a woman who dressed up as a man to participate mm -hmm. in the Civil War. So I thought, who's left? <laughs> 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 and uh, I went back to thinking about Harriet Beecher Stowe. I worked at the Mark Twain and Harriet Beecher Stowe's houses after college. And I thought, hmm. Did I ever like, you know, I didn't really connect with her at that time, but I went, you know, started to kind of go back and research about her. And I thought at the time I had just had my oldest son and I was like, oh, she was an artist trying to raise kids and make ends meet while still trying to write. That clicked, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, she was a working mother who also wanted to make a difference in the world, who was passionate about social issues and social change. And, you know, within her own context, having been raised in a family of ministers, right, like everybody in her family had a voice except for the three women, the, mm -hmm. the, four, uh, the four daughters who, um, most of whom found, uh, you know, also went on to do uh, great things. Her sister Catherine in education, her sister Isabella with the women's rights movement. Um, right, so they had this instilled in them, but they didn't have the opportunity of being a preacher, of, mm -hmm. of being a mobilized people in that way. Um, but she did through writing. Yes. Yeah, and uh, when they moved to uh, Cincinnati across the river from Kentucky that was um, very eye-opening to her 
when she saw slavery firsthand and some of the things they experienced or saw slaves um, escaping. Um, and that really kind of started Uncle Tom's Cabin. Coupled with experiences and her losses in her own life that she then connected to the pain that um, slaves uh, would go, you know, it, it was uh, some connection for her of uh, an inkling of what that life was like. Um, so, but the pandemic gave me the opportunity to revisit. Uh, the play called Aunt Hattie's House. So it's now called Aunt Hattie's House Reconstructed um, because we've come so far with how, uh, I mean, Uncle Tom's Cabin is controversial in many ways. It created change in this country. It created a fervor around ending slavery. Mm -hmm. um, by the depiction, uh, the you know, uh, through her writing, um, you know, gave it, it created that national conversation around abolition through popular culture, right? It just yes, was yes. wildly popular in a way that we can't even imagine today, and um, yet it became so popular that it's a step removed from the origin right the stereotypes mm -hmm. of uncle you know the people still use the phrase uncle tom right not always knowing what where that, it came from right and um it wasn't a negative thing originally right or uh and it has some you know gone through periods of being negative and so i really wanted to revisit the play and you know asked about woodhull do i have to rewrite it but i did make some pretty uh, significant changes to Aunt Hattie's house to really address, um, I began to see Stowe as what we would call today an ally, right? She had an opportunity as a white woman to stand up against slavery and to be a voice for people who had no voice. And that's what she did. Um, so, you know, by changing some of the excerpts I pulled from her writing by um, ad addressing some of how we look at uh, racism today through her. You think her. the uh, book is still relevant today? Um, it's, it's a surprisingly good read, I mm -hmm. think, if you mm -hmm. like, you know, real descriptive story. Mm -hmm. You know, she really had a gift for um, description and action and character and she predated Mark Twain by writing in dialect mm -hmm. um, you know so the characters really come to life I mean there's a lot that uh, you know you have to read it within the context of, of the time. time but mm -hmm. I, I think it's an engaging book but it's also you know she wrote a novel a year for close to 20 years mm. And we've nearly forgotten all her other writing. Exactly. And, and exactly. she wrote a lot of uh, humorous short stories. Um, in the play, I included uh, excerpts from one called The Canal Boat, which is about people traveling by canal boat and just uh, a picture of what an absurd way to travel it right. is, um, where she advises to take uh, both a, a good stock of clean towels and patience with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but uh, uh, really funny, uh, you know, and we don't um, think of her as a gifted writer. We think of her as the impact she had on American society. Well, in, in some way, that, uh, that is probably even more important in terms mm -hmm. of uh, uh, cha changing, mm -hmm. cha changing a society that yeah. I think uh, people maybe should go back and read it mm -hmm. because there are people to this day who see them on the television who tell you that, oh, the South left the uh, Union because of states' rights. Really? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. happened to slavery? Oh, no. no. Mm -hmm. no. People today still talking about how slavery wasn't such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Well, when I created the show, was to tour in Missouri, and, uh, you know, and it was a whole Civil War-themed program that we toured through the state, it was thought that we were going to debate the Civil War. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, 
No, I'm pretty sure the outcome is known. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they were traitors. Yeah. <laughs> really, they were traitors. Yeah, but they're, they're still figuring that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's why I say it has not lost its relevancy. There no. are, we, no. we live in a, a society that people could yeah. not fathom that yeah. we would be in this day and age, 2022, mm -hmm. we are still discussing mm -hmm. there are merits to slavery, really? Um, and that yeah. uh, the, the whole thing about yeah. states' rights mm -hmm. it was not about slavery. Yeah. The enormous yeah. financial institution of slavery made this a rich country. Mm -hmm. So it's, Right, it uh, wouldn't have survived without that. Uh, yeah. Slaves built parts mm -hmm. of the country, including mm -hmm. the capital. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, these are parts of history that we, yeah. just like with Hull, mm -hmm. we fail to uh, recognize that these things really, mm -hmm. really are mm -hmm. true. Oh, no, yeah. let's, not, let's not make little white kids um, ashamed of some of their history. Well, listen, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the Constitution is a revolving mm -hmm. kind of uh, document. It, should we go back to having three-fifths slaves? Is that, is that how yeah. we should be counting yeah. people? Should we mm -hmm. actually go back? Should we not have let women vote because it's not directly said mm -hmm. in the Constitution? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yes. So you can't, in that particular one, I think you can't get, unfortunately, get away from today's kind of angry, misguided politics. Mm -hmm. But we have, uh, I think we have a video of you performing. Oh, yes. So we have an excerpt. So within the play, um, uh, I do share some of uh, a couple, three excerpts of uh, from Uncle Tom's Cabin, and this segment is a chapter called, um, I believe it is, "When a Politician Becomes a Man," <laughs> and uh, so this is uh, me uh, Stowe reading from the book. Um, politician has just come home from a session where the senator uh, to Ohio. They've just enacted the fugitive slave law, and lo and behold, there's, uh, he finds out there's um, uh, escaping slaves hiding in his kitchen. <laughs> He's got a, a little bit of um, angst. Uh, got to figure out what, uh, <laughs> what to do. So, and his wife encourages him. <laughs> so let's. Well, at this yeah. critical juncture, Mary and John are called into the kitchen, and there they find all the servants and children plus Eliza and Harry. Now Eliza recounts her journey across the Ohio and the story resumes. <clears throat> I, I say wife, uh, she'll have to get away from here this very night. Why that follow will be down on her scent bright and early tomorrow morning. If twas only the woman, she could lie quiet till it was over. But that little chap, well, he can't be kept still. He'll bring it all out, popping out of a window or door. A pretty kettle of fish it, it, it would be for me, too, to, 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 to be caught with them both here just now. No, 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 they'll have to be got off tonight. Oh, tonight? Well, how is that possible, John? Well, there's my old client, Van Tromp. He's come over from Kentucky and, well, he set all his slaves free and he has bought a place seven miles up the creek. And it's a place that isn't found in a hurry. Well, she'll be safe enough there. The plague of the thing is nobody could drive a carriage there tonight but me. The creek has to be crossed twice and the second crossing is quite dangerous unless one knows it as, I, as, as well as I do. Oh, your heart is better than your head in this case, John. Could I ever have loved you had I not known you better than you know yourself? <laughs> well, this is a character that we do know, met, most people know. I don't mm -hmm. think that uh, a lot of people have re actually read the book, but they know, they know about mm -hmm. the character um, and they probably know, at least they recognize the name if yeah. they have never even yeah. read the book. So. Yeah. How did, how did this particular character, this is a more famous character, how did she come into your subconscious to get going? Um, just like, because I saw something looking for Civil War characters. So, okay. you know, that's how, um, uh, that was an opportunity that prompted me to first um, write the play. Um, but I have, uh, my next project that I'm uh, oh, underway yes. <laughs> on is... Um, is a woman named Julia Margaret Cameron, 
who uh, we were traveling in the UK in 2019 on the Isle of Wight mm -hmm. and uh, driving around and uh, my husband studied photography in college and he hit the brakes and said oh my gosh it's Dembala it's Julia Margaret Cameron's house <laughs> so we had to stop and I you know again never heard of this woman who was a very early art photographer in the uh, mid 1800s yeah. picked up a camera uh, got her first camera at the age of 48 yeah. and really cre you know was on the forefront of creating photography as an art form and uh, I've met other people who have studied photography formally who were not taught about her oh my okay. husband happened to be but yes <laughs> um, yes, yes. Uh, right so again it's like this woman did groundbreaking work and was not, uh, you know, she had exhibits and things in her time, but right. was always criticized, uh, you know, came on a much more critical, under a much more critical lens than her male contemporaries and um, um, was doing very different work because a lot of her work focused on, she used whoever was in the neighborhood or her maids or family that were visiting, uh, she would dress them in costumes and did, posed these, um, you know, either scenes from mythology or Shakespeare or historical characters um, and used a soft, you know, it was all about the lighting and soft focus and uh -huh. uh, how she would develop the photo. So like really a lot of what art photographers do today, but at mm -hmm. the time people were like, well, that's not in focus, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, that's not understanding <laughs> what um, she was trying to do. So, mm. um, so I'm just fascinated by and I, thinking about, you know, photography was a new technology, right? Um, and there was fear around that, right? So, which mirrors a lot of what we experience today, right? What shape does technology? taken our lives and today photography is so present everybody's got a camera in their pocket right they got it in uh, their phone right <laughs> so um you know what is that context of the ability to chronicle your life or capture things through a photograph uh you know what was that like when that was new mm -hmm. um and also um her family uh, you know, I also will address uh, colonialism. Her family was, you know, she grew up part of her childhood in India, lived mm -hmm. a good part of her life there. Both her and her husband's families were part of that colonization of India. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I want to address that as, you know, a social issue. Did she the take well. uh, many photographs of India? Later in her life, sh yeah. she did. She also... Uh, was part of, uh, you know, so there's a, a lot of elements around class. I mean, right, there's, if you're using your maid to be your model in your photographs, like how is that different than a, an artist model, right? Like, I mean, there's kind of elements of that, but she was, uh, Tennyson was her neighbor on the Isle of Wight, and there was this whole social literary circle of people mm -hmm. um, that she also would do portraits you know she didn't consider them portraits, but she would take photographs um, of people that later when they traveled back to India and around the world she also then wanted to capture people of other cultures well, she so she did do some kind of active looking at the Indian society and and making and then the caste perhaps the caste system which was uh well, both so, her, yeah. yeah both her father and her husband were kind of in india like they were part of creating the judicial system oh, okay. like you know imposing their british colonial judicial system right. on um the indian people so um there's a lot to learn there because again that's not something we're taught much about in this country so that's true that's um, true well we know nothing about european history we don't yeah. we don't even know our own history yeah i asked about that about india because my father was in india during the world war ii uh -huh. and he was not a professional photographer at all but the place mm -hmm. was so fascinating that mm -hmm. I, I i have in, in my 
possession, which I gave given to one of my daughters, he must have taken about a thousand mm. photographs. Wow. And yeah. of course, British India in World War at World War Two yeah. was also what today is Pakistan and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a yeah. lot bigger, and he picked up some of the. Um, uh, Islamic stuff. He was in mm -hmm. Lahore, which mm -hmm. is now part of Pakistan, but yeah. was then a very important part of British India. Yeah. So, um, it's, like it's, Americans yeah. were were interested it's, in this because it was so foreign to anything yeah. they had ever seen before. But the politics of it is very complicated, and that uh, you know we think of we were talking India, mm -hmm. India as a country, but it's not right. There's like all these regions, and the nuances of that are different. And yeah. it's a country that still struggles today I mean climate wise they're facing all kinds of things today but um, yeah and was it right for you know <laughs> what was the British role in that and when was it for good and when not but so we'll say. <laughs> So is, are any of these elements going to be as part of your, the thing that you're developing about the photographer? Are you going to mention that piece? Yeah, I'm uh, still doing research. And so, okay. you know, I'm researching now and uh, we'll, you know, have started writing, but we'll be writing the next couple months. I just received a grant from, uh, uh, administered by the uh, Southeastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, New London City uh, ARPA grants for the arts. Um, so I will be doing a reading of the work in progress in the fall at the Lyman Allen Art Museum. Okay, New London, yeah. Uh, in New London. Um, and they have a, a female artist who will be on exhibit at that time. So a photographer? Uh, it was a good fit. Not a photographer, but uh, somebody who paints uh, botanical paintings on newspapers that are, uh, you know, in the news, what's on the, what the news on the page is important okay. as a contrast to the beauty of the flower, right? So there's oh. <laughs> news, pretty flower, right? So, yeah. um, and I'm going to have a panel discussion about female artists. So um, it was a really visual good. Visual artists, photographers, as well as painters. As, and all, so, all, yeah, 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 performing yeah. artists, right, but, yes. you know, I'll pull that okay. um, together. So it'll be a whole, like a whole day event at the Lyman Allen later in the fall. So um, people can follow uh, Be Well Productions, which is my production company on Facebook, mm -hmm. to uh, learn when. When um, and where. Yep. Well, where we, you know, it's just become, when yeah. and what time. <laughs> yeah. and so I'm thrilled that the Lyman Allen Art Museum thought, oh, yeah, this is a good fit. We want to do more performance here. And um, it was a great opportunity to um, receive some funding. Right, that's yeah. great. Yeah, that's just so. great. And there's that, and there's more for your planning. So I'm also been working on a multi-character play called Finders Weepers, and I'm uh, was invited to you know again another great thing because it's virtual. I was invited to be part of a playwrights group um, out of the Legacy Theater in Branford, Connecticut. So since we're meeting virtually, I said sure I'll I'll join that. Maybe I'll get some of these plays written, and. Um, so the Legacy Theater, uh, which is a beautiful uh, theater that opened in 2020 in Brantford. It's the old um, Stony Creek Puppet Theater, but they've done a beautiful job. It opened when the crush it. just came. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, they opened after, which is amazing. Oh, okay. So they're just doing an amazing job. And they're um, giving us a theater uh, for a week to for all the playwrights in the group. Uh, there's nine of us to have excerpts from or short plays that they've been working on, right? So that's Sunday, June, July 24th. It's free. It's uh, like 12 to 4 or 10 to 4, uh, but people can come and go um, every hour, you know, um, to hear uh, some new plays by local writers. So and it, every hour there's going to, so every hour there's going to be a different performer? Uh, there's different, there's like two or three. Uh, everybody's doing like 10 to 30 minute pieces okay. so yeah okay. there'll be a couple of pieces each hour but there'll be an intermission every hour so people can um if they don't want to see everything they can and it's perfectly kind of free free right off of 95 i suspect uh, in yep. Brantford. and it's legacy theater in Brantford, and you can go online and get the details and okay. register for a free ticket that's wonderful yeah. that's what do you have any idea of like what you, what what is going to be yours i mean beside the title uh, it's a play um it's a family story of, you know, mother of kids who are becoming adults and what that 
process is. So it's oh, multi-generational. Just, just like life. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> just like life. <laughs> Write what you know, they say. Uh, Write what you know, exactly. But also something that came out of our writer's retreat that I had kind of had this image in my head. Uh, for local people, if um, a real prominent ish image in the play, uh, across from Avery Point, there's a salt pond with a tree in the middle that the egrets sleep on the branches at night. Oh, okay. And I always love driving by at night because the white birds on the branches yeah. look like a magnolia tree oh. at night. So egrets and that image of the tree um, kind of were the inspiration for this I piece. I see. Yeah. <laughs> are birds going to be part of the story? Egrets are part of the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a lot All of bird right. imagery. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Do you have a, a kind of an outline of the of the play itself, or are you still working on I'm it? So it's about half written, um, and it's been a whole different process. Not only because it's a multi-character play, um, but I just kind of started getting these images and some of the scenes and some of the things that I wanted to write about. Um, but I thought, oh, I can't write this because I don't know what the whole story is yet. And then I started to hear writing coaches and whatnot saying like, no, you don't need to know the whole story. Just start writing and the story will like come to you. So I've just kind of, I'll pick it, you know, over the last three years, I pick it up every so often, read it, say, oh, yeah, I like that. I'll keep working on it. Write a scene or two, put away. <laughs> but I'm still not sure where the story's going. And then the last, um, I picked it up. I do a thing in uh, April, the Dramatist Guild runs a, they call end of play, which is just a challenge to dramatists to write it right every day in April and see what you create. Oh, okay. Um, and write end of play on April 30th. I didn't get to end of play, but it's the <laughs> it's a challenge. You know, either start something new or pick up something that's been sitting in the drawer. So this April, when I took Finders Weepers out, you know, it's kind of really caught me in a new way so I've been really focused on further developing it and then this group came up and I was like yeah I'll work on this play in this group. You're going to so. keep the you're going to keep the title or is the is the play uh, play title open no, for? No I love the title the titles. Oh okay <laughs> all right. All Finders right. Weepers has a lot of um, yeah. Means a lot to you personally? Well it's, it's integral to the story. Uh, I see yeah. I see. Yeah. How many characters are we thinking it's, about? It's uh, five characters. Five characters. A, a yeah. mother, father, and a couple of kids? Is that what we're yeah, imaging? Yeah, uh, 15 and a 20 year old and a mother, father, and the uh, grandmother. Okay. Right. Yeah. So Not at all related to your own life. No. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, I have given so I have a director for the reading series on the twenty fourth, and um, she was like, "Wow, the like middle aged woman is at the center of the story," and I didn't have like you know, of course, but like you realize like yeah, there's not a lot of plays where you know older women are at the center of the story, so. I'm sure plenty of actresses complain about that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Not only on the th in the theater, but in uh, which brings us back to that's how I started writing yes. plays in the first place. Right. Right. Yes. right. <laughs> Why don't we get enough attention? Yeah. Yes, it's exactly right. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I think it, as a you know you know I'm a, no a novelist, so mm -hmm. um, I was inspired by COVID because a playwright actually needs people to react to them. Mm -hmm. a, a novelist doesn't necessarily need that kind mm -hmm. of reinforcement to see, yeah. oh, am I going, you can yeah. really make a lot of terrible mistakes as a novelist because <laughs> you don't have any right. kind of window <laughs> yeah. to say, mm, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, so I went, uh, to my surprise, mm -hmm. I went backwards mm -hmm. when I thought, what, what, uh, true to myself, but yeah. backwards. So my first book during COVID was Rockaway Riptides, which is about the 1960s and mm -hmm. picks up my high school days. Yeah. Uh, and the 1960s were pure chaos. We had uh, the beginnings mm -hmm. when I was in school, the beginnings of the Vietnam War. Yeah. We had just uh, lived through Kennedy's assassination. Mm -hmm. So our president is dead. We have, and in my novel, which is really true, is a kid who graduated the year before us comes home in a body bag mm -hmm. from Vietnam. And that begins a whole series of things. First of all, when you're 16 and 17, 
you, yeah. you really don't understand death. Right. Uh, you don't understand yeah. the finality of it. And, and, mm -hmm. and you think, as, as we got, even though we were somewhat ignorant, as we got a little bit more informed about what was going on in Vietnam, we thought mm -hmm. to ourselves, why, 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 why did he die? What did he die for? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of get into that, and your thoughts aren't necessarily well connected, but because mm -hmm. you're talking about 16, 17, eight year, yeah, 18 year olds, yeah. but you, you get that sense. And then the other big thing was music, music. Every kid, right. uh, I played the clarinet, every kid thought yeah. they were going to get a garage band going, right. going to write, write a great song, going to yeah. be recorded, going to sell a million copies. Yeah. And just be like the Rolling Stones and, and the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's part of the of that story. Mm -hmm. And then the second one was I went even further back in my family history. And my grandfather was a uh, gangster who ran booze for Dutch Schultz. <laughs> so, so I wrote that story because what happens, pro Prohibition starts in 1920. Yeah. And he's the accidental gangster because he doesn't set out to yeah. become a gangster. He is recruited. And when gangsters recruit you, you don't you really have an no. opportunity to say <laughs> say no. That's yeah, exactly correct. right. So that's accidental gangster, Dutch Schultz and me. Yeah. So that's uh -huh. my that's my memoir. I, I only wish that my mother was alive because mm -hmm. it was her father to be able to yeah. read it and even comment on mm -hmm. some of the stuff because what mm -hmm. she remembered, not necessarily are the most important things that he was doing. Uh, yeah. She remembers the family parrot and the and the cats and the dogs. <laughs> And not necessarily uh, the gist of carrying a gun and worrying about whether you're going to get shot, mm -hmm. either by the police or mm -hmm. your fellow gangsters. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a, yeah. a fun thing to write. And I did yeah. a lot of research about Dutchels yeah. because my mother surely didn't have any <laughs> right. real inkling, except that he was a bad man. And when, when you told the fam when you told people on the street that daddy worked for Dutch Schultz, everybody was afraid. <laughs> and that was the very best of things. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to get uh, some, inf some info from me about mm -hmm. what it is to write, I teach a creative writing class. It's absolutely free. Wednesdays at 11 o'clock a.m. at the Pawkatuck Neighborhood Center, which is right by Valenti's used car lot. Right off of 234. If you're interested, you can contact me or just come on over. We always love to have a few more students. And you can write whatever you want to write. Somebody's writing a travel uh, guide. Somebody's writing about their life history. Somebody's writing about flowers. I don't care. <laughs> just we love you to just keep on writing. So it's been fun. I hope mm -hmm. you've had a good time. I hope you're going to follow up on all of Emma's great ideas uh, and her future things. Uh, so keep an eye. And this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. Bye-bye.